what do you do for a living? It's the first question that you hear whenever you meet a new person, after you get to know their name. And whenever I hear this question, it's always a problem for me. You know why? Because this is how a typical conversation looks like. A person comes to me and asks me, what do I do for a living? And I uh, say to them, I'm a product manager. Okay, you are a project manager. No, I'm a product manager. Hmm. So you manage people, developers who create products. No, I do not manage people. I manage a product. I make sure that our customers and users are getting what they want, when they want it, with the highest quality. Okay, okay, so you are the guy that makes all those fancy presentations and call all those useless meetings where we waste our time, so you are that guy. And by this time in the conversation, I'm so tired and so exhausted after hearing it for so many times, I just nod along and say, yeah, yeah, yeah that's me. I, I create those presentations. But today, I would like to give you a much more detailed answer on what I do. So to introduce myself, my name is Dan. I come from Pakistan, but I've been living in Rothschild for a few years now. I work in Nokia as a product manager for our network management solution. And I find that this product manager role is one of the most misunderstood roles that we have in our software organizations. And there's a very good reason for it. Because what no one else is even thinking about, he is supposed to do it. So you can imagine the complexity. If you take any product, software product or any other product as well, you have three main stakeholders. You have your users, your customers, that will actually use the product. You have your developers and engineers that are actually making the product. And then you have your investors, your business. It might be your company, it might be your, if you're a startup, might be your investors who are giving you the money and will actually expect some return. So the product manager's job is to act as a link between these three. But the last thing and the most important thing that the product manager is supposed to do is have a product vision. It's very important for him to act as a leader, to know what is exactly this product supposed to solve, what is the use case, what, where he sees this product in future, and should be able to communicate it to all his people, including his engineers and all the support staff that he has. This is very important. I will cover all these things in a bit more detail, and it will take about 40 minutes, so I will not use the last hour. I know that you are tired. And then we will have some time for question and answer. But the first thing that I want you to remember, and this is very important because I don't like it when I hear it, is this. A product manager is not a project manager. Please, do not. if someone says that they are a product manager, don't say, OK, I know that you're a project manager. This, this, they have nothing in common and completely different responsibilities, completely different roles. So if you remember one thing from this talk, it would be this. If I had just one line to describe what a product manager looks like while he's doing his job, it's like he's doing everything that no one else is doing. So a typical product manager would look like this guy. You know, doing seven different things at the same time, but still doing it with a smile on his face. Because this is his job. I think this is the most challenging thing that we need to learn when we become product manager, the art of multitasking. There are some studies which say that humans actually are not so good at multitasking. When we do multitasking, we lose focus. I think product managers are here to prove it wrong. Because we have to do it on a daily basis, every time, because you're working on something, and suddenly there is a crisis that you need to take care of. So you need to change your context, solve the thing that is more urgent, but still be able to come back to your original topic and do it with the same focus that you had before. It's very important to learn how to do multitasking. But seriously, what is a product manager? <laughs> While I was researching for this talk, I talked with some colleagues that I work with who are also in product management. I even asked the boss of my boss, what does he think a product manager's role is? And I always got some different answer. No, there is no one definition. When you talk about project manager, everyone knows what they're supposed to do. When you talk about product manager, everyone has their own definition, which is quite understandable because Every company, every product is different. They have their own structures, own responsibilities. So the role that is associated with the product manager also is different in all those places. But when you really come down to the basics, a product manager is someone who works with his de developers, tells them what features to be developed, 
what features have the most priority, and how to develop them. Second, he makes sure that the features that are being developed are actually valuable for our users. They will use it. We are not creating something which just looks fancy on the paper, but is not usable for our users at all. The third thing is that he needs to have a vision. He needs to know where this product will look like, not just tomorrow, not in one week, not in one year. What kind of problem he's want, he wants to solve with this? What is the main goal here? And it might be that this main goal will only be achievable in a few years. I will also come back to it in a bit more detail. And the last thing, which is not so nice, but you have to take care of this, is to also take care of the business. By business here, I mean it can be your company. So for example, in my case, it would be Nokia. If you are working in a startup, it might be your investors who put money in. Or if you created your own startup and building your own self, then it might be your, yourself who contributed to the money. And these people expect some return in the end. And you need to align all of them together with the features and the, uh, that what user wants and what the developers are making. So a product manager guides developers to create features which provide value for users and are aligned with the product vision and business strategy. After hearing this definition, can you name any famous product managers? Come on. Raise your hand if you know any famous product managers. One, two, three. OK. OK. So people who raise their hands, can you give me some names? OK. Any other? Sorry? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. OK, so you got it right. These guys are product managers. Steve Jobs, Larry Page, Sergey Brin, Mark Zuckerberg, all of these guys are product managers. And you may be thinking, how? They are the founders and CEOs of their big technology companies. How can I say that they are product managers? But really, go back to the beginning, how they started. They had one problem they wanted to solve. Steve Jobs wanted to create a first personal computer that is usable by everyday person. Larry and Sergey, they wanted to create a search engine which can search anything on the internet and can be used by anyone. And Mark wanted to make a social network. They had one idea. They found fo their co-founders, maybe in some cases more technical people, like in case of Steve Jobs, who helped them to create that product. And they always had a vision, what they want to solve. What is the end goal of their product? And based on that, they were able to build that product to such an extent that today there are whole companies based around that same vision. Apple is today still making consumer products which are used by everyday people. Google is still their main business is search engine. And Facebook is still mainly a social network. And their vision that they had even on the first day when they came up with the idea of starting creating this product is still the same and is visible in their companies. Now let's get, back, get into a bit more detail. What is the first thing that you need to create a product? I think you need users. A product which does not have any users is useless. If nobody is going to use it, then there is no point in making it. So the first thing you need is users. The second thing you need is developers. People who are technical, who know how to use the technical tools to solve a problem and are able to make your idea come to life. But developers don't come cheap. I think most of you are developers, you know. It's not easy to hire good developers. So you need somebody to give you money to hire them. Then you need money to even find resources, nice computers for them, software that they need to build the actual product, and so on. You need this, this kind of uh, resources and money to actually create the product. And the intersection of all these sorry, is product manager. He sits between these three stakeholders. And his job is to actually coordinate and have everyone on the same message, to align their expectations and their demands with each other. Now, each of these intersections have certain tasks and roles. And we'll get a bit more 
we'll look a bit more in detail, not too much because you know this is a big topic and can be depending on the product and the company that you are working on can have many different aspects. But just to give you just one idea how it might look like. So let's talk about users and developers. Basically, we are all users. We all use our products. Even if you are making a product, if you are designing a product, if you are writing code for a product, the first person to use it is you yourself. But when you press a button on the application that you are creating, you know exactly what is going on in the background, which algorithms are being used, what functions are being called, and how that result actually comes to the screen. On the other hand, a user, he may have some educated guess on how it might work, but he will not know or even care how actually it works. All he wants is that when he presses that button, he gets what he expected. He gets what the result he wanted in the beginning. So you have two, two people using the products but have kind of different view on the product. So what happens is that when you have a new feature, new request to be done, a good developer, a good programmer will want to do it in the least, in the way that will require least effort, in the way that his code will actually be manageable after that, will be usable, easy to manage. But the user, he doesn't care. He doesn't care that having a button in the corner which he wants to be there will cause all your code base to change. He does not care about that. So when you get a request from a user, and you go to your developer and you say, I need a button there, and he comes and says to you, come on, that will make my code look ugly. So this is the kind of problem that you need to solve when you, when you are dealing with these two stakeholders. The one thing that comes to mind when you are talking about this is designers. I think in many companies, for many products, especially the one which have a kind of a user interface, you have designers there, whose sole job is actually to understand how a user will actually interact with your product and then turn that into requirement towards the developers. Other task and role that you might see in this area are community management, social media marketing, user research, analytics, web design. Because it's not just understanding what users want. In other kind of products, for example, the one that I work for, we don't sell our products to the end user. We don't sell it to people. We sell it to other businesses. And we have a lot of features in our product. But not always they know that all those features are available. So it is also our job to tell them, to market them, to tell them what other kind of features they can use to solve their problems, which they might not be even thinking about. So it goes both ways. You get input from users and give it to developers, but you also get uh, features that you, some of your customer might not be recognizing, and you need to tell them. The second intersection is between users and business. This is where the money comes in. An investor, your company, will always ask you how much revenue I can get with this product. When will I get it? How much profit I can expect? You need to have a business model. You can, you can create a product, but you do not have a business model. At the end of the day, might be tomorrow, might be one year, might be a few more years, but eventually you will either have to sell it or it will die. You will not be able to sustain it. There are two kinds of main examples that come to mind. One is where you sell product directly to a user, and he pays you money for it. So for example, e-commerce site. Or if you create a very nice game and put it on App Store, you charge for people downloading it. And you get money immediately. Other is, example is like social networks. Nobody here pays for using Facebook, but somehow Facebook is making money. How? They, they take the data from the users, and they sell it to advertisers who are actually giving them money. So you have kind of two different kind of users, but both so interdependent on each other that you cannot focus on just one. Few tasks and roles that might fall in this category are business development, advertising, monetization, strategic partnership. Sometimes it is possible that another product, another company is doing something which, if you will combine with your product and sell it together to the customer, will be much more attractive for the customer than just selling your own product. You need to, need to make this kind of partnerships as well, depending on what kind of product you are making. Market sizing or market research. What is going on? What is your competitor doing? You are creating an application, but maybe another person is also creating the same kind of application. You need to check that. You need to use it. What kind of features they have? 
What are people saying about those products? What are people saying about your products? What are analysts talking about? All of this comes in the market research. Business model development, how actually you will earn money out of it. It's very important. The last one is developers and business. I think this is where I would say most of the day-to-day -day task of a product manager fit. Let's take a typical example. You are building a product, and you need to make a decision. Should I use the open source software, or should I buy a proprietary software and pay for licenses? I need, you need to create a new component. Should you create it in-house with your own developers, or get something which is off-the-shelf available outside? made by another company. You have 10 different features, but you have only capacity to make five of them. Which of those 10 features should you be working on first? All of these questions fall in this area between business and developers. You need to always optimize the money that you have with the resources that you your developers need. And always come to a middle ground where you are making, in the end, the features that are actually required by the customer, but as well as also they will create money for the product. So some of the tasks here are budgeting, product roadmap. Product roadmap means that you tell exactly which feature will be available in three months, in six months, in one year, in two years, in five years. So you give a breakdown so that people who are buying your product can actually plan when certain feature will be available. Business vision. It's a bit different than product vision because business vision is somehow about how you will actually make the money, not, not the fact that how you will actually, how actually you're solving the problem of the customer. Slightly different, but more or less covered in the same product vision slide as well. Release product management. This is what I do on a daily basis. This is I, my real title in my company is release product manager. What he does is that he has, and literally for our product, we have at the moment, more than 300 requests from our customer that they want us to develop in the next three months. And we have the capacity to give them more or less 70 features. So you can imagine out of those 300, and all of those features are good, required, make sense, are requested by real customers who are actually giving us a lot of money, but still I need to somehow prioritize them so only those top 70 which will give me the most value will actually be developed first. And then the rest, we will either do it later or will not do it at all. But maybe you also see here project management. And I said that project management is not equal to product management. A bit contradictory. But this example applies to the case where you are starting a startup. You are the founder. You are the CEO. You hire three developers to create the product. But you have to also manage them. You also have to manage the, how their day-to-day task will look like. So this comes under project management. So a lot of times, it is possible that you, all, as a product manager, will also have to deal with the project management task as well. So the day-to-day -day planning and the sprint planning, etc. Now you know much, I would say, much more detail. It's not enough. It's just to give you highlights, because there can be a lot of cases and a lot of different things that can fall between these areas, which I didn't cover here, because there are just too many. And depending on the product, you might face different challenges. Let me tell you a bit about more about myself. Let's change the topic a bit. I come from Pakistan. I moved to Rotswolf about four years ago. But before I moved to Poland, I had moved in my life from one city to another six times. So this was my seventh move. So as you can see, when you, you change a country, it's actually a bit difficult to adjust to it, and it takes time. But for me, it was not that of a big of a problem, because I had already done it six times before. So I managed to get used to the new environment, especially the weather that we have here, more or less quickly. But two years ago, when I was working as a software architect, I decided to go to product management. A big change, because once you become a product manager, you do not really look at the code anymore. There is just simply no time. Even if you think, uh, you know, I will do it in my free time, but there is no free time. That was a huge challenge and an interesting one at, as well at the same time. And it took me some time to get used to the new way of working, new kind of problem. And just to show you how it 
how my typical day may look like, I made this sample day of my work. So I will tell you how it looks like. I wake up, I, in the morning I take my coffee at 8 a.m. And I usually walk to work because it's not so far, so while I'm walking to work, I decide to have a look at my calendar. And I see that I have a meeting at 9 a.m. with my development team, with my developers, to see what kind of problems they are facing, if the progress is okay, if what we promised is coming on time. Then later on at 12, I have another meeting with sales head in different regions. So one from China, one from Asia Pacific, one from South America, North America, and to talk with them and to understand what is our sale forca sales forecast and if our, any of our important customers have any problems that need to be solved. So a general status meeting. And I have a to-do list as well. I need to do market research because I haven't done it for the last couple of months and it's time to see what is out there and what our competitors are doing. So before I know, it's already 9 a.m. and I talk with my developers, and they give me a bad news. They tell me that the feature that they are developing right now had some technical issues and will take twice as long as they initially estimated, which means that in next release of this product, they will not be able to deliver the second feature that was also promised. So I had two features to deliver in this, product, in this release, upcoming release. Both of them promised to our top customers who are giving us a lot of money, equally important. And now my developers are telling they can only do one. And I know, if a project manager would be here, he would say, let's put more people and maybe do it. But you know, as a product manager, it doesn't work. We have our constraint and we know it. So we will not say, let's get more people. We will understand, yes, sometime it happens and we need to find another way. How we do it? We find a mitigation action. You know, these are very strange words. You don't need to consider them. What it means is actually that I need to go to our customer who will not get what we promised to him and tell them that it's a good thing. <laughs> it's a bit difficult. Getting, it takes some getting used to. But you know, there are some things that you can do. Maybe they are not aware of the feature that we are developing. Maybe you can tell them that it might help them solve their problems. If they're still angry, maybe you can offer them some kind of discounts in the next time they will purchase your product. Any way which will not make them leave your product at all, even if you have to hear some bad words from them, which happens as well. But what is more important is actually, after I'm done with this, come back to my software architects who actually estimated the timeline and told me, based on which I promised this to a customer, why it happened. It happens, it's time, time to time it happens, but we shouldn't let our mistakes just like that. We should look at them more carefully, analyze them, and see why it happened so that we can avoid it in future. So this is one of the tasks I would like to do, but not so urgent. The urgent task is to find the mitigation action. So instead of market research, I spend the next three hours working on the mitigation action, and I decide the best way is to this is going to be tough, so I will have to offer them some kind of discount. We'll give them some features for free, and hopefully they will be happy and will be willing to wait for one more month for what they wanted initially. And then I have my meeting with the sales guys. And I tell the person who is responsible for that customer that his feature is not coming. But don't worry. We have a mitigation action. This is the message. You can go to customer tell him that he will get a couple of things for free, and hopefully he will not have any problem. Of course, sales guy is complaining a lot. He does not want to face the customer in this kind of situation. But just because I already prepared something for him, which is valid and which will help him to clear, to tell our customer that we actually care, and yes, we made a mistake, but we want to still solve it and do it better next time. So we get by it. But then the real problems come in. First of all, pricing. Pricing is a very interesting topic when, are, when you are a product manager for a software product. Because when you are making uh, hardware things like a laptop or, or this clicker, it's easy to identify what price you should sell it for. You just take all the cost, you make some profit, you see what other person is selling it for, and you put it a bit less, and then you start to sell it. It's very easy to, I would say, relatively easy to find the right price for your product. When you're talking about software, 
you actually have the opportunity to get 99% profit or even 1%. Really depends on the situation. So maybe it took you $1 to make it, but you can earn $100 on it. Or maybe it took you $99 to make it, but you can still earn $100. And it's very hard and very, it takes some effort to actually correctly price a feature so that it earns you enough money, but still at the same time is good enough for the customer to buy. They can afford it. So it's not so easy. A lot of time, salespeople come and they want to sell something, but they do not know how much they should offer it to customer for. So they come to me, and in this case, he comes and tells me that the new feature that we want to offer does not have a price, and he needs it by the end of the day because he needs to send this offer to this customer today. I promise that I will do it. But then they tell me that our sales forecast for the next quarter it does not look good because it's quarter four, end of the year. All the customers are not spending any money. They need to give Christmas bonuses to buy the employees' gifts. They do not care about the business thing so much. They want to save money, so we will not get what we initially planned. This means that if I want to meet my targets, I need to come up with a new strategy. I need to work with my sales guys, maybe find new customers, maybe sell something, some of the features which they are not currently using but really would like to use, or some other way just to meet our targets. Because I have those investors and my company to answer to who will ask me why did not I meet my revenue target. So we decide together that we'll work on it in this week. And then the last thing they tell me is that next week they are organizing a sales conference in Philippines, which is far away, different time zone. And they tell me that all their customers from Asia Pacific region will be there. And I need to go there and give them demo, tell them about our new features, and just simply make them like our product. So I need to prepare for that conference as well. So it's already 4 PM. And I have so many tasks, and I just finished pricing for that feature, and I said it. And I still didn't do that market research. And it's already eight hours working in the office. I want to go home. But I decide, no, I didn't do it for two months. Maybe it's time I should do it. So I, I start to look at the press releases of our competitor products. And it turns out that they are marketing a game-changing feature, which could kill us. But fortunately, we are also developing that feature, just that we haven't marketed it yet because we didn't think that it was time yet. But now it's too late. If I don't tell our customers tomorrow that we are also have this feature and it will be available in two weeks, they might switch to other products. So I have another task to do. I need to make a marketing plan for a new feature. I need to talk with our marketing guys who will create some press release so that our customers actually understand that, yes, we have this feature as well. And at this time, it's already 6. I think enough work for today. The rest of the task can wait till tomorrow. I decide to go home. And while I am having my walk in the evening, I get a call from my boss, who tells me that our company has decided that for all our products, we need a detailed five-year roadmap plan, which means I need to make Tell them exactly what will come every three months, which features for the next five years. And they need it by the end of this week. I just shut down the call and I go home. But then I get home and I think, OK, I have a couple of options. I can work eight hours for the next week and not complete any of the tasks that I have in my to-do list, and as a result, ruin my product. Or I can work 16 hours a day, solve all those issues, but don't have any social life, don't meet my friends, don't go out for drinks, just go home and sleep, that's it. And maybe I would be able to save my product and solve all these issues. You may be thinking this is a really worst day, who would want to do that? But this is, this is on purpose, I wanted to show you really a lot of problems that can occur in your day-to-day -day job. But they will not occur like they did in this day, not at the same time. And you will not be the only one working on them. You will have teams, you will have other support people, like your salespeople, your marketing people, your developers, your engineers, who will help you with all these tasks as well. So you're not the only person who is doing them. But I wanted to show you how 
it might look like. And by the way, all these things, I did not make them up. I actually asked my colleagues at work. I work in a product management team where we have five, six people. And I asked them what kind of problems they usually face as a product manager. And they listed them, and many more. And I chose just a few important ones to show you what kind of things that we deal with on a day-to-day basis. But you know, when I was telling you about those three stakeholders, and also about my awesome day, I didn't mention one thing that I mentioned earlier on. Any guesses? Vision, product vision. I think this is the most important and most challenging and most interesting thing that you do as a product manager. What do I mean by a, having a product vision? How many of you know Elon Musk? Raise your hand. For those of you who don't, you should read more technology news. He is the CEO of Tesla Motors, making all those electric cars, but also founder of SpaceX, where, which are making these spacecraft. And recently, you saw some video where they landed their rocket back on a platform in the middle of the ocean by itself and didn't have to, because usually when you send rockets, they get destroyed. They don't come back, but they managed to save it. So these are the things that they do in his company. And a couple of months ago, he gave a huge presentation at some conference where he mentioned that by 2025, they will have a spacecraft and technology ready to take humans from here to Mars in three months. It will be a three-month journey, and it will be really comfortable, and anyone who has money can afford it and go there by 2025. But does, is it his end goal to just go to Mars and then visit and come back? No. Actually, his goal is, and his thinking is, that we need to colonize Mars. If we want to survive as a species and don't go extinct like dinosaurs did, we need to go to another planet as well. That means that we need to go to Mars, but not only go there, make it so that we can actually live there. This is his end goal. This is his vision. But do you think he can do it in 10 years? 20 years, 30 years, 50 years, maybe 50 years we might have something. But this is his vision. So everything that they do in SpaceX, every product that they create, every spacecraft and rocket launcher that they make, every technology that they work on is somehow leading to that one goal, to get to Mars to colonize it. Maybe it will take them 50 years, maybe it will take them 100 years, but that's what they are working on. And this is what I mean by product vision. You don't see just one week ahead. You don't see one month ahead. You don't see three months ahead. You don't see one year ahead. You need to see as far ahead as possible. And think about the things and really come to the basic idea of why you want to do something. What, what is the purpose of your product? What is it trying to solve, actually? How it will be actually usable? This is very important to know. But not just know. It, it's not enough that you know it. You have a lot of people working on the same product. You have your engineers. You have your salespeople and marketing people and a lot of other people if you have a big... We have a product which where we 1,500 people work on it. All of them, all times, need to know the product vision, what they are trying to solve. If they do not know, how can they make really the product that actually is supposed to be made? So I have a task for you, all of those who are developers here in this room. When you go to work tomorrow or next week, you need to find the product manager in your company. Because sometimes it's not so obvious. If you work for a startup, it might just be the CEO and the founder. Maybe you have your own startup, and then it might just be yourself. And you need to ask them, what is the product vision? What are you trying to solve? What is the actual purpose of this product? When do you see it achievable? All these questions. And if they are not able to answer them, then you need to think about changing a job and working for a different product. Because how can you go on the right path and reach your destination if you do not even know what your destination looks like? This is very important. All those people, the famous product managers that I showed, Steve Jobs, Larry, Sergey, Mark Zuckerberg, all of them had a vision of what they wanted. And they're still working towards that. Maybe over time it has evolved. But the core thing is still the same. Apple is still making the consumer products that every one of us uses here. It just has evolved from personal computers to smartphones and tablets and other things. But the vision is still remains the same. And as long as people know it in that company, without even Steve Jobs being there, that vision is being fulfilled. And this is what I mean by 
product vision. So this is why I find it the most interesting job and most important job of a product manager. And it does not mean that when, we, when I, I give you examples of these big CEOs with big companies, but it also applies to small startups that are just starting to really know what they're doing. As well as for people like me who work in a big company, but on a product which is comparatively smaller one in, compared to the rest of the products in the company, it is still important for me to not only know what is Nokia's vision, what Nokia wants to do, and what we are trying to solve with our product. How does that fit into the whole Nokia vision? If I don't know this and I don't communicate it to my developers, for sure they will make mistake, which will cost us and will not be according to the vision that we tell everyone else. Remember your task, you need to do it. Raise your hand if you're a developer. That's what I expected, that most of the people in this room will actually be developers, so that's why I included this. Why should developers become product managers? I, I, I am a developer. Okay, I was a developer. I worked as a developer, I worked as a software architect, and eventually I moved to product manager. So I know how a developer feels. I still remember all those technical things. I still follow all the technical blogs. I still con come to conferences like Code Dive. Still talk to my developers who are working on our product. So I can tell you from my own experience why should developers become product managers. Let's look at those three main stakeholders that I told you in the beginning. Because product manager is the kind of job where you don't necessarily need to have technical background. Look at Steve Jobs. He was not a programmer himself. He knew programming, but he was not himself programming. He taught himself to be at the intersection of an artist and an engineer. He considered more himself as an artist than an engineer. But he had all the developers working for him, creating all those technology, technological products, and awesome ones. So a product manager can come from any background. He can be a developer. He can be the one who did an MBA or he can be one who never even went to any university or studied anything, completely non-technical person, and still be able to have a, be a good product manager in his company and for his product. So why I think the developers have an edge? Because when you look at those three stakeholders, one, as a product manager, you will deal with the users. Does having technical knowledge give you any more advantage than a person who does not know how his product is actually made? I don't think so. Because users actually don't care about the inner workings of a product. They don't care what kind of code you are using, what kind of languages you are using, what are the algorithms. They don't care about that. So it will not give you any advantage. What about business? When talking to your people who give you money, will it give you any advantage if you are a technical person? Actually, no. Maybe it will be inverse. A person coming from an MBA background will be able to understand much better the business things of a product. But what about when you deal with developers? And actually, for every software product, you have the one thing that the biggest team is of developers. The rest of the people, like product managers, the project managers, salespeople, they're very small teams, few people working on some specific tasks. But it's the developers that are the core of a product, that actually work, write the code, make it come alive. So when you talk to them, isn't it easy if you also know what they're doing to talk to them, to actually write the requirement that they actually will understand? Or just instead of writing one line, I want an awesome product, and then expect them to create an awesome product, because some product manager might do that. Steve Jobs didn't tell them exactly how to code, but he was still able to guide them exactly what he wanted. I don't think a lot of non-technological people can actually do that. He had a special skill. I find that in my experience, me having a technological background, understanding the coding process, how the products are actually developed, helps me much more to talk, when I, to talk with our developers when I'm telling them that we need this feature and we need it in this way, rather than some of my colleagues who do not come from a technical background. And this is why all of you, I think, who raise their hands, and even those who are maybe not developer anymore but have a technical background, are the perfect fit to become a product manager. So I want to encourage all of you to think about this as your next career move. When you want to do something more, something different, don't go for all those other fancy roles that you keep hearing 
go for a becoming a product manager, but keep an, also this in mind that you just never know what a product manager is called in your company, so you need to figure that out. But maybe you have a great idea. You need to start your own startup. You need to create your own company. If you have a vision, and you are able to communicate that to other people, and it makes sense, it is solving a real problem, then you, you can do it. You can be the, that next product manager. Maybe you will be the one who will create that next big company that, and I will, in 30 years, someone else will be showing the famous product manager, and one of you will be on that slide. So I want to encourage all of you to think about becoming product managers, either the one that you're working on right now, or if you have some idea starting your own company. As I promised, I didn't take so long, a bit more than 40 minutes, but what do I want you to remember from this talk? Three things. First one, remember the key stakeholders, developers, users, business. They are very important, and as a product manager, your job is to act as the key point between them. Every information that goes from one stakeholder to another goes through you, and you need to align it accordingly. But more importantly, you need to have a vision. As I said, vision, having a product vision is extremely important. Without a product vision, there is no way you would be able to effectively do your job. Second thing, as developers, you are the perfect fit to become product managers. I cannot stress this enough because I have seen it in my personal experience. I have seen it around me when I have seen other product managers who do not come from a technical background, and what kind of difference does it make? There are very few successful product managers out there that did not come from a technical background themselves. So if you are interested at some point to do something other than writing code, this could be the perfect career for you. And the last thing, and the most important thing, because this one I just cannot handle when someone says that, product manager is not equal to project manager. Remember this, if someone tells you that they are a product manager, do not <laughs> say to them that you, you, okay, you know you're a project manager. It's not the same as I told you, as I explained to you, I think you understand now the main differences, that it's completely different. So that's it from me, let's take some questions if we have any. <laughs> okay, thank you a lot, Zain, about your really dynamic presentation, and the first question is? Hello. Here. Oh, okay. I would like to ask you mm -hmm. how your job was changed. It was changed uh, after uh, passing to the agile world, because uh, I've heard that uh, Nokia adopted mm -hmm. some uh, uh, some Scrum uh, mm -hmm. framework and and and, and uh, so on. And how your daily basis change after? this uh, adopting the scrum okay so maybe you have heard about the role product owner the product owner is actually a product manager it may be possible that a, as a product owner you're responsible of just one component inside the bigger software product but then if you would really look in the hierarchy you will definitely find one person who is responsible for all those product owners as well and is guiding them so when you talk about agile, I think product owner term is used more often. And in our company, we have much more product owners than we have product managers. I always worked in agile, so I don't know how it looks like without agile. But I think in terms of how the software is actually being developed or what kind of framework or processes you are using, it's not as important as your day job as your other tasks are. Having a product vision, being able to communicate it to your developers and acting as a leader if they have a question they they can they you are the person they will come to so these are the more important tasks and i think these are the things that are more challenging if you come change your job from a developer to a product manager to actually get used to any okay. more questions okay any more questions i see that the second one i have uh, uh, have one question um, yeah. What you said about uh, vision mm -hmm. is for me very important and it's mm -hmm. very easy to realize, to, to, to uh, do in small company or in mm -hmm. startup. I would like to ask how it uh, looks like in the big company, big corporation like uh, Nokia. How much freedom you have in creation this vision of your product? Because as you said, it has to be everything, uh, you pr the vision of your product have to be, uh, have to fit into the 
uh, into the vision of uh, the whole company. Mm -hmm. So how, how independent you are in mm -hmm. the creation of uh, this vision? Okay, very good question because I don't know, maybe in yesterday in the morning you saw this Nokia Vision video which says that increasing the human possibilities of a connected world. So that's Nokia Vision. But if you really look into a bit deeper, it's a very wide vision and with no end in sight. We'll always be working on technologies that are helping humans to solve their problems and to live their life better. How much freedom we have as our own product? Actually, in my product, we have, we have about 1,500 R&D engineers, developers in working on our product. And we have 65 product managers. So usual ratio is about one product manager for every 20 engineers that have, you have. So it's not just, and in this product management, then we have a hierarchy. So we have one person who is boss of my boss, and then there is my boss, and then I come. And we all have our specific task. But when you talk about vision and the strategy, it needs to come from the top. And when you look at the product, it really depends on the product. At the end of the day, if it is me meeting this Nokia vision, then it's okay. But how exactly it will meet? I work for a product which is for network management. So our job is to make it easy to manage this huge complex network with so many components and make it easy for the end user to use it. That's our vision as our strategy and product vision, I would say. So anything that we do, has to be aligned with that. If we are creating more complexity in managing the networks, then we are doing something wrong. Okay, the next one. Yeah. Uh, thanks for the talk. I really felt encouraged to <laughs> um, maybe become product manager, but I wanted to ask actually, because let's say that, okay, I want to give it a try or I want to be a product manager, but now my CV looks like, okay, here, software developer, software developer, software engineer, maybe senior software engineer. Mm -hmm. And <laughs> how from those positions or how from those perspectives you did this, you did this change from like one career path to, well, different. You mentioned you were product uh, owner, but is there any hints you could give like how to tweak your career at some point mm -hmm. to go to this direction? Okay, so I can tell you how I did it. I was a software engineer and they were looking for a product manager for the same product that I was working on. And since I knew the product line manager, I just went to him and I told him, it seems very interesting, do you think I can do it? And he uh, started to ask me some questions. He asked me, like, like, how can we increase our revenue? Did you notice any ideas how we can do it? And you know, I was working on the product, so I had some idea how we make money, so I gave him some ideas. And then he asked me, okay, so what do you think we should develop next? what should be the main next feature in our product? And uh, as a developer, I already knew that as well, what I wanted to see in our product. So I told him that as well. And it turns out that these are the exactly th the things that you look for when you're hiring a product manager for the product. He needs to think about these things. So I wouldn't say uh, having a developer background, you need to learn specific skills before you can move. What I did in my case, I had no idea about product management when I became a product manager and had to learn it and think, and I think the most difficult thing was to how to multitask. Because really, as I showed you in the example of a typical day, there are different things that are coming up all the time. Your to-do list is always long. There is even a joke that a product manager always has five things on as his first priority. And then there are a few others at lower priority. So this is, I think, the difficult thing to use, a difficult thing to understand, I would say. Then, of course, you at some point, if you will become more experienced and have more responsibility, let's say, you will be the product manager of all your product and there is no one else as a product manager, then you need to also take care of the business aspect, how you will make money and all those things. And it does require some kind of studies. It does require help from some other people who will actually teach you how, how actually we earn money and so on and these kind of things. But I would say these are not so important. You can learn them. These are skills that you can learn, just like you can learn any other language if you are a good developer. I think these kind of skills you can also pick up while you're doing the job. What is more important is your way of thinking and communication. I would say acting as a leader and effectively communicating to other people is also very important because you can be a great product manager, have great ideas and vision, but if you are not able to communicate it to your people, they will not understand and will not do what you want them to do. So this is also very important. And I, and I also read another joke that the product manager is someone who was a programmer, but a bit more extroverted. So he used to talk, he likes talking, so that's why he became a product manager. <laughs> 
I have another question mm -hmm. connected to the agile world. Yeah. Have you ever think about stopping doing uh, developer status uh, meeting? Because it, doing this every single day, it looks like it is something from chaotic domain instead of complex domain, which mm -hmm. is in our industry. We are not uh, on the war. Mm -hmm. uh, the, the, our world not change so quickly that we have to uh, take decision every single day. So we, ha we can wait until the next iteration. Have you ever wondered about stopping doing sta status meeting every single day? Okay. First, we don't do them at all. In my case, I don't do any development status meeting. How we do it is developers or the scrum masters actually who are leading the teams update the statuses in some tool, and I just go to that tool and see what is going on. They only come to me when there is a problem. They don't come to me when everything is working fine. That's, that's how it should work. If everything is OK, as a product manager, I should assume everything is OK. That's why no one is coming to me. But if there is a problem, then it's developers, their scrum leaders, their team leaders that need to come to me and tell me exactly what the problem is. So usually, we do not have development status meeting. I know in the scrum teams, you may have daily status meeting, but those are very short. What I talked about here is like, we have a huge problem. We have a huge feature which is being delayed, and that requires a lot of discussion. Why it happened, how it happened, what we can do in future not for not it to happen, how we can convince our customer that it's a good thing. So all of these things, it takes time. So you have these meetings only when there is a problem. If there is a no, not a problem, I would say you do not really need to have the uh, status meeting every day, or even every week. OK, thank you a lot. And thank you for presentation. I saw that I know a path for CEO, in, <laughs> for example, in my, our company. Also, I have one conclusion of your presentation. Uh, if I don't want to my boss interrupt, I just have to forget my cell phone in the office sometimes. <laughs> yes. 